Thanks so much for coming out today to hear a bit about um, Argentinants. Uh, hopefully you'll leave here today and when you do go home for, uh, you know, to ex enjoy the sunny day, you'll be able to look at the ground and all the ants running around at your feet with sort of a newfound appreciation for Argentinants. Uh, when you see ants out and around in the world, uh, here, pretty much anywhere in urban California, the ants that you're seeing are almost certainly Argentine ants. And so I'm going to tell you about some of the work that I've been doing and people in my lab have been doing for about the past 15 years on Argentine ants. And this will be a little bit of a, a sampler of a few different things, but um, the common theme that sort of runs through all these different parts that I'm going to tell you is how ants uh, interact with one another to form social groups. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the um, sort of extreme social behaviors that display, some of the mechanistic ways that they recognize who's who within the colony, and then some more recent sensory biology that we've been working on. And so here's... exactly what you're thinking it is. And then we'll talk a little bit about the specifics of how Argentine ants know who belongs in the super colony and who doesn't. A little bit about their nestmate recognition mechanisms. And then I'll talk about um, some processes of learning and memory which play into this um, sociality and super colony formation. And then if there's time at the end, I'm going to touch on some of the really recent genomic work that we've done that's revealed some additional interesting things about Argentine ant biology. So Argentinians, as the name suggests, originate from South America, shown here by the blue circles. So this is their native range here. They occur in um, northern Argentina, parts of southern Brazil, Uruguay, and Paraguay. And they've been introduced to pretty much every Mediterranean-type climate in the world, shown by these red circles here. So they're in New Zealand and southern Australia, the true Mediterranean in Europe, South Africa, um, various parts of North America, and many, many Atlantic uh, and Pacific islands. And throughout the talk, um, I'm going to try and be, hopefully I'm consistent with the color coding. So whenever you see red circles, that's an introduced population. Whenever you see blue circles, that's a native population. So in their introduced ranges, Argentines cause all kinds of problems. Um, first of all, they're an agricultural pest. Not in terms of the damage they do directly to agricultural crops, but uh, the damage they do indirectly through the behavior shown here. Argentines invade an agricultural ecosystem and what they do is they set up a mutualism or a symbiosis with um, plant pests, such as these scale insects that are shown here, sort of suction cup down onto the surface of a leaf. And what happens is Argentinians protect these scale insects, as well as things like aphids and mealybugs, from potential predators or parasitoids. And in return, they get a sweet liquid that's produced by the plant pests called honeydew. And so the ants get food, and then they provide protection for the plant pests. And so when Argentinians come into agricultural ecosystems, the population densities of these pests really just booms out of control, and so in turn does the damage that they do to crops. A second way that Argentine ants uh, are a problem is as a household and business pest. So if you, you know, in the East Bay here, in the Bay Area generally, if you go into the average backyard and turn over a rock in sort of a moist area, you'll see a scene sort of like this, where Argentine ant workers are milling around, taking care of their babies. You may see some queens running around. And Argentines are actually the number one household pest in California that extermination agencies are called upon to, re to remove from people's houses or from businesses. And not only is this economically costly and kind of, you know, a pain, it's also um, environmentally damaging because the primary way that we deal with Argentine ants nowadays is to spray general insecticides around, which kill all kinds of non-target organisms in addition to Argentine ants and uh, degrades uh, water quality and soil quality. And that's been well demonstrated here in Northern California, that these insecticides run off into watersheds. And then finally, Argentine ants are directly uh, ecologically damaging. So when Argentine ants invade native habitats, they eliminate virtually all native species of ants that occur there. So normally, um, sort of a, a natural native habitat, like an oak woodland here in Northern California, should, be ha should have between 15 or 20 native species of ants. 
And these native species of ants will be running around doing all kinds of different things. They're important predators on other arthropods. They're prey items for other things in the ecosystem. They're turning soil, dispersing seeds, providing all kinds of ecological services. And when Argentine ants come in and eliminate this huge ant community, they eliminate all those services that are provided by native ants. And this has consequences that, of course, reverberate through the ecosystem. So the most well-documented example of this is work by Andy Suarez in Southern California showing that the um, coastal horned lizard, which is a species that's um, listed as um, threatened in California, the primary reason for its decline is because Argentine ants have come in and eliminated the native ants that horned lizards rely upon for their food. And this has led um, indirectly to the decline of horned lizards. Um, one of the things I love about this photo is that this is actually not an Argentine ant here. This is one of the native ants, a Campanotus carpenter ant that we have here in California. And so small that you may have overlooked it is an Argentine ant here in the foreground. And these ants, these uh, Campanotus carpenter ants, are actually one of the most sensitive species to Argentine ant invasions. They're one of the first to disappear when Argentine ants come into a native habitat. And this huge size disparity between Argentine ants and the sensitive native species, of course, raises this question, you know, how can these individually feeble-looking Argentine ants exert such a profound influence on these really tough, you know, robust-looking carpenter ants? And how big is the carpenter ant? Uh, well, this Argentine ant here is probably two or three millimeters long. So in California, if you, you know, look down at the ground and you see a small dark brown or blackish looking ant running around, that's almost certainly an Argentine ant. There are very few other uh, ants that look like that, and there are very few other ants, period, um, where Argentine ants have uh, invaded. So if you like walk out of this room and look down at the sidewalk, you'll probably see an Argentine ant somewhere between here and your car. Okay, so how is it that Argentine ants can exert such a strong influence on these seemingly tough native species? And the answer is that uh, lies in the Argentine ant's colony structure. So when we think of an ant colony, we typically think of something like this cartoon example here, where there's a colony that occupies a discrete habitat or territory in space, and there may be a nest, or in this example there are two nests that comprise this colony. And if you look out across the landscape of most ant species, you see that there's this sort of patchwork of um, colonies of the same species and sometimes colonies of different species that are dividing up the territories they're competing with each other for food. They're sometimes fighting for space at their boundaries. And so you have this sort of patchwork of intraspecifically um, competitive colonies. In contrast, Argentine ants here in their introduced range have a colony structure known as unicoloniality. So even though across an equivalent amount of space, you may have the same number of nests as a native species of ant, these nests are all functionally interconnected as a single cooperative network. So workers and queens can move back and forth between these different nests. There are no colony boundaries. And these nests actually move in space, too. They can fuse and fission. So you may have seen this in your yard. When the sprinklers come on, Argentine ants evacuate their colonies to a drier area. Or during the summer, when it gets really hot, they relocate their colonies inside your house. And so these are sort of really fluid networks that are always moving around, exchanging resources. You know, a dead animal may show up somewhere in the middle of these nests, and they'll all temporarily move themselves close to the you know, this new food resource to take advantage of it. What this means functionally for the population ecology of Argentine ants, though, is that they've eliminated all these costs associated with competing with other Argentine ant colonies. There are no other Argentine ant colonies. And so instead of dumping resources into um, defending territory, defending food, um, direct aggression and fighting with other colonies of Argentine ants, all those resources in unicolonial species can instead be redirected towards population growth. And so Argentine ants are able to dominate native species of ants just by their sheer numerical superiority, which is a consequence of this unicolonial colony structure. And people have known this for a long time. People, uh, the first uh, recorded um, reference to Argentine ants as being unicolonial was well over 100 years ago. And here's sort of what this looks like on the ground. These are data that um, I collected a long time ago at a few different sites in the introduced range of Argentine ants. And what we, um, what's shown here on the x-axis is distance between nesting sites that are being tested. On the y-axis is the average level of aggression between ants from those different sites. And so basically what I was doing here is picking up Argentine ants, you know, walking 100 meters away or 200 meters away, picking up Argentine ants at the second site, putting them together in a behavioral assay, and recording their aggression. If they just sort of sniff each other and don't, and basically ignore each other, that's a very low aggression score of one, indicating that these ants come from the same colony. Or if they you know, attack each other, use chemical defenses, try and tear off each other's legs and antenna and heads, that's an aggression score of four. And that indicates that somewhere in that space, I've stepped across a colony boundary, right? And I'm putting ants together from two different colonies. They don't like each other. 
And what you can see here is um, the behavioral features that um, uh, illustrate or uh, exemplify this unicolonial colony structure. At all of these sites, except for this one exception here, which will become important later on, you can see that Argentines um, from hundreds or sometimes thousands of meters apart show no aggression towards one another. Right? So over those distances, Argentines belong to the same colony. They're forming these big super colonies. And so to investigate this in more detail, we've conducted field work uh, for a number of years uh, throughout California and in the native range of Argentines in South America. Um, and so the circles shown here are field sites where we've collected Argentines. The data that I just showed you were collected locally within sites. Um, you know, for example, in Southern California, you know, at relatively small spatial scales. But we also wanted to look at how this played out over very large spatial scales. What's the spatial extent of these big super colonies in the introduced range? And do we, do we see the same thing in the native range? And it turns out we don't see the same thing in the native range. It's very, very different. Argentines behave as if they're almost a different species in the native range. They have a behavior that's much more similar to this multicolonial colony structure that's typical for the native ants we have here in California. And so that's shown here. This is the same format as the previous slide I showed you. On the x-axis, again, we have distance in meters. On the y-axis, we have aggression score at eight sites in the, in, in the native range of Argentines. And again, with one exception up there, all of these sites look like they're multicolonial, right? So for example, here at Ocampo, I pick, we picked up Argentines. We walked 100 meters away, pair them with Argentines from the second site, and you typically see very high levels of aggression. So in the native range, in contrast to what we see here, if you, you know, walk sometimes tens of meters, but almost always hundreds of meters, you've crossed the colony boundary. These Argentine ants are forming these small multicolonial colonies in their native range. And this suggests that there's been some you know, behavioral transition, some social transition during introduction of Argentine ants um, to California and other parts of their introduced range. Christian? Yes. Um, on the second from the right, from the left, on the second row, if you see uh, level four aggression, at a very small distance, no, go, go further left. Yeah. Right, well, I need to go one more. Yeah. But that's very, that's what, 20 meters? Uh, yeah, that's about 10 or 20 meters. Right, so I think this, I think I remember this colony, actually. Okay. And uh, I think this was an Argentine colony that existed on a single tree. And so if you walked off and sampled anywhere, or any other site of Argentine ants around that tree, they were always from a different colony. Right, and so, and that's sort of the lower end of the distribution. That's about as small as we've seen an Argentine ant colony be. But that's, you know, typical for what we see for native ant species here. You know, each different tree is a different colony. Right. And in some cases you see, you know, in different, in different colonies at the same site, you know, the largest one was here. So it's about 150 meters wide. And so there's size variation within sites in the native range. But there's nothing like what we see in the introduced range where, you know, across our, except for this site at Itadivate, where the whole site belongs to a single super colony. Okay, so what happens if we you know, project this out now to a larger spatial scale? So these are data that were collected on those long transects that I showed you on those big maps in California and Argentina. So now, again, we have aggression on the y-axis between sites, but the x-axis, even though it's distance, this is now distance in terms of kilometers, right? So we're comparing ant colonies that are almost up to 1,000 kilometers apart here in California between San Diego and San Francisco, or actually Ukiah, north of here. And what we see is a pattern, surprisingly, that, um, or maybe not surprisingly, that, ex that looks exactly the same as what we saw at a small spatial scale. Right? In the native range, of course, when you drive 100 kilometers away, you've always crossed the colony boundary. You're always comparing ants from different colonies, and they always show high aggression scores. So those are the blue circles here. But in the introduced range, these super colonies extend across the entire state of California. Right? So at every single one of these behavioral assays that we conducted, between San Diego to way north of here in Ukiah, we didn't see a single incidence of aggression between Argentinians. We all know California is special. That's right. <laughs> well, this is true elsewhere in the world, too. We'll see in a moment. Uh, and I must say, this was the most boring field work ever conducted, right? Driving. <laughs> not only is it not somewhere like tropical and beautiful and exotic, this is like driving through urban California, and then it's staring at ants that don't do anything. They're just sniffing each other the whole time, right? For weeks and weeks. So even at a very large spatial scale, you know, this, this difference in social organization is extreme between the native range and introduced range. And it's actually even more extreme than that. These are data that we've published recently. Um, so we've, through the years, we've sort of filled out where the colony boundaries are. And everything that's red here belongs to the same super colony in California. So if you compare ants from any of these red sites, they'll accept each other as colony mates. There are some exceptions, like that one that I showed you in the first data slide, 
um, where there are small little pockets of RDT ants that will attack ants from the large supercolony and vice versa. It turns out they're genetically, um, behaviorally, chemically different from the large supercolony, and they're probably the product of secondary introductions that keep occurring from the native range. And in many cases, these things pop up, and then they disappear as the huge supercolony just wipes them out, just overruns them. But um, interestingly, other uh, research groups have shown that other parts of the introduced range also harbor supercolonies. So this is true for New Zealand, the true Mediterranean, Japan, um, Hawaii. In those places, Argentinians display the same colony structure. as In those other introduced ranges, they display the same colony structure as they do in this introduced range in California. And recently, we've um, obtained import permits to bring Argentinians to the quarantine facility here on campus and perform behavioral assays between these different supercolonies. And it turns out that all of these different supercolonies on all these different continents are actually the same supercolony behaviorally. So even though these ants in Europe and California and Australia have been separated for you know, over a century probably, and by thousands and thousands of kilometers, if you put them together, they still recognize each other as if they're members of the same colony. A really extreme behavior for ants. Ants are normally very aggressive and territorial, and this is you know, this uh, cooperative behavior that's um, displayed over vast amounts of space and time. This is almost certainly the largest um, animal social group known, this huge super colony. And so to delve into some of the mechanisms underlying this transition in behavior, we first started doing some basic population genetics using what are called microsatellite markers. This is essentially just a way of doing DNA fingerprinting. So we're looking at parts of the genome where there are these nucleotide repeats, like this GA repeat here. And what's characteristic about these microsatellite um, loci is that they're very unstable through time. So through the generations, it's very easy for there to be replication errors in the DNA duplication and have uh, extra repeats added on, so an extra GA added on or subtracted off. And because of this high mutation rate, that means that these loci have very, very high levels of variability or polymorphism within populations. And so they make really good markers for estimating levels of relatedness or figuring out who's related to who. And so this is uh, the sort of first pass we made at this data many years ago. We've fleshed out a lot since then, but the story hasn't changed. The take home message here across these different microsatellite loci is that in Argentina, if you measure expected heterozygosity, which is a measure of genetic diversity, you see a level that's um, about three times as large as the level of genetic diversity you see here in California populations. And if you look at the actual number of alleles possessed at these loci, the number of different forms of these nucleotides, there's about twice as many of these alleles in the native range as there is here in California. So Argentinians, during their introduction, not surprisingly, have lost a lot of genetic diversity. This is typical for introduced species across the board. They usually you know, are introduced in a small population. You have this initial propagule that's introduced. And then as the population grows and spreads, they all sort of remain descended from that initial um, small propagule. So they've gone through what's called a population bottleneck, and they've experienced the pattern here, a genetic bottleneck, where they've lost genetic diversity. Interestingly, though, if we look across space, we see um, a pattern that um, sort of matches the behavioral patterns we've seen. So these are data from those same uh, sites that I showed you before, where we were comparing um, aggression across sites that were separated by hundreds of kilometers. But now, on the y-axis, we're looking at the genetic similarity, just the you know, percent of these alleles that they share at these uh, microsatellite loci. And you can see in the native range, Argentine ant colonies at these distances share you know, between about 20 and 70 percent of their alleles. And that's significantly lower. It's a non-overlapping distribution with what we see across California. In California, they share between 90 and 100 percent of their alleles. So if you look across space in the native range, not only are they these small little colonies that are fighting with each other, but these colonies are all very genetically different from each other. Here in California, you have this huge homogeneous super colony, and if you look at the genetic patterns underlying that, they're also genetically homogeneous. So they're behaviorally and genetically homogeneous across California. And so we have a working hypothesis for that, to explain the origin of these super colonies in the introduced range of Argentines, and this is how it goes. In the native range, like most species of um, not only ants, but other organisms, you have high levels of genetic diversity, and you have large genetic differences that occur between colonies, and the ants in these colonies use these genetic differences somehow to figure out who belongs to their colony and who doesn't. Right? An Argentine ant worker goes out, foraging in the native range, encounters other ants, um, sniffs them, we know that these are chemical cues, to sort of give away what I'm going to tell you next. They sniff each other, and they use those odors to assess whether or not you're a relative mine or not. If you're not a relative, you must be from a different colony, and I'm going to attack you. But if you smell similar to me and my relatives back in my colony, you must also be a member of my colony, and I'm going to accept, accept you. Right? And so you have these small, genetically diverse, genetically divergent colonies, and this multicolonial colony structure of the native range, like most species of ants. 
But then, as they pass through this genetic bottleneck, they've come out on the other side with very low levels of genetic diversity and very high levels of genetic homogeneity across space as they spread, but they're still using the recognition rules um, that evolved in the native range, right? So here, Argentines are going out into the world, they're encountering other Argentines and saying, do you smell like a relative, do you not? And because they're so genetically similar, they think everybody is a relative, and in some ways they actually are a relative, and so they function as a single big super colony across space, right? And so we have these high, you know, these high levels of genetic similarity that are translating into high levels of um, sociality across large geographic areas, um, because Argentines are still using the rules for accepting or rejecting individuals that evolved in the native range. Right? And so you have these large, ecologically dominant super colonies forming. Okay, and so um, in more recent years, we've sort of taken this down to sort of a smaller, more reductionist scale to try and figure out what's actually going on in the mind of these individual ants. That is, what is it that what it explains how these two ants from one super colony are able to recognize that this individual comes from a different colony. And um, there's a large body of work that's been previously done on um, how social groups should be organized and how these recognition systems should evolve. And here's one model that um, has um, been proposed for social insects, ants, bees, and wasps. And the idea is that you know, individuals from different colonies possess some sort of phenotypic label, some sort of cue on their body that indicates the um, colony they originate from. We call these labels. And so here, this ant comes from a colony, and it's labeled E. That says it comes from colony E. This ant here has a different label, A. And in social insects, generally, these are believed to be a class of chemicals called cuticular hydrocarbons, waxy chemicals on the exoskeletons of ants. And we'll talk a lot more about these in a moment. But you also have to have some idea of what are the labels that you're going to accept as nestmates. Right? And so here, and, and this is what's called a template, this idea in the head of ants of what's acceptable um, in terms of labels. And so this ant, it carries label A, but it's willing to accept any individuals that carry label A and B. Same thing here, this ant from a different colony has a different label, also has a different template. They run into each other, they sniff each other's hydrocarbons, and there's a mismatch between the label and template, and so they both attack each other or reject each other as non-nestmates. And in social insects, it's believed that these templates form through imprinting early in the life of the ant. They emerge from pupation, and they don't really do much for the first about week or so of their life. And it's believed during that time period they're imprinting on the odors that are around them in their colony, and that's what's forming this template. So this ant, even though it's expressing label A, because it has other ants in the colony that express label B, it's imprinted on both of those odors, and it's willing to accept ants that, that express either one of them. Okay, and so we're we started off becoming really interested in identifying what are these labels specifically. And I love this photo. I don't know if it's clear to you there, but um, this is um, a photo we found at the San Diego Historical Society. Actually, it's from the Hank San Diego Historical Society. It was published in the newspaper there. And it says, Combatants in San Diego's 1926 war against the Argentine ants. The ants munched trees and gardens to such a degree the zoo brought these ant eaters up from somewhere in South America to try and control them. Right? I mean, this is a, a, a perfect example of a failed biocontrol strategy. We don't see giant ant eaters running around. Um, but there is a lot of interest in um, developing control strategies that are based on these um, particular hydrocarbons. If you remember, I told you earlier that the way that we control Argentine ants now is by spraying insecticides that kill all kinds of things besides Argentine ants. If we can figure out a way to develop control strategies that trick Argentine ants into just killing each other, no longer recognizing each other as nestmates or somehow breaking down these super colonies into different warring units, then maybe we could have a much more specific targeted control strategy for Argentine ants. And so we started off with this general class of chemicals called cuticular hydrocarbons. And although there is lots of evidence from other social insects that cuticular and Argentine ants, that cuticular hydrocarbons are the general class of chemicals involved, it turns out that there are well over 100 of these different hydrocarbons on the body of an, exo of, of an Argentine ant. And so that's what's shown here. So we first started off just sort of describing what are the different chemicals on Argentine ants across the super colony and from these different behavioral groups that um, belong to different super colonies, these different color colonies here. And so we can take ants, we can extract the chemicals off their exoskeleton, we can inject them into a, a gas chromatograph, and we get something out that looks like this, where along the x-axis we have each of the different chemicals, they come off at a different time, and uh, on the y-axis we have amount. So essentially each of these different peaks shown here is a different chemical. These are all hydrocarbons, um, but there are small ones, and there are big ones, and there are some that have double bonds, and then there are some that have one methyl group or two methyl groups. They vary in a variety of different ways. 
And so from all this noise, what we want to do is extract information about which subset of these hydrocarbons, which specific chemicals are the ones that are being used as labels, right? These hydrocarbons, you know, initially evolved in insects to keep them from drying out to prevent microbial infection. So most of them are probably doing different things. Um, and so we want to pull out just a handful of those that are actually being used as labels by Argentinians. And so we followed a, followed a general procedure that's shown sort of in a simplified version here. We divided these hydrocarbons into different categories based on how well they correlate with aggression between ants, right? So we're looking for hydrocarbons that are similar between ants that accept each other as members of the same colony, regardless of how far apart they are. Um, and so hydrocarbons, um, hydrocarbons that are used for, as labels should be uh, similar in concentration between ants that accept each other, but they should differ in concentration between ants that reject each other, right? And so here are sort of two different categories of hydrocarbons. The black arrows show hydrocarbons that occur on the exoskeletons of Argentine ants, but they're probably not good candidates for labels, right? So here we have two nests that belong to one supercolony. This colony is uh, behaviorally different. It's from Temecula, which is TE up there, right? And you can see, even though ants from these two colonies will attack this one, and vice versa, these peaks that are shown by these black arrows are about the same concentration all of them. They don't differ when you see aggression. The open arrows, though, are examples of hydrocarbons that um, might be used for nest mate recognition. We see that they occur at low concentration in this nest. They occur at low concentration in this other nest that belongs to the same supercolony. But then, a nest that shows aggression towards this large supercolony, they occur at a very high concentration. Right? And so what we wanted to do is go across this entire hydrocarbon profile, these 120 or so different chemicals, and categorize them for which ones correlate best with aggression. And this will give us some um, indication of what are the most likely candidates to be used as labels for nest recognition. And so we came up with this huge table, it goes this way for about 20 feet, where we have all of these different sites and all of these different chemicals, and we're looking th for things that um, vary, a lot between, vary a lot between colonies that attack each other and that don't vary between colonies that are friendly towards each other. Right? And doing that, we came up with this uh, list of our, uh, what we think are the actual labels. These are all um, what are called alkanes, which means they're straight carbon chains, right? They have these carbon backbones. And then they vary in that some of them have a single methyl group poking off, some of them have two, some of them have three methyl groups poking off in various orientations, and they vary in chain length. So the top one there is you know, 35 carbons long, these are 37 carbons long, this is 33 carbons long, right? But they're fairly simple molecules. And so when you see differences between these hydrocarbons, you can, um, when looking at the hydrocarbon profiles of these ants, you can predict, based on how different these chemicals are, whether or not they're going to attack each other or not. And so this is really nice correlative evidence that we're on the right track, that these are probably the recognition cues that these ants are using to figure out who's a friend versus a foe. But to really nail that down, what you want to do is a functional experiment, right? Ideally, in a dream world, you would want to take this chemical, right? Take an ant out of a colony, stick this chemical on it, throw it back in with its nestmates and say, you know, is it still recognized as being a member of that colony or not? And so we established a collaboration with um, Ken Shea and his graduate student, Robert Sulk, um, who synthesized these in pure form for us. And so I'm going to show you data based on the ones shown here in green, but now we have all of these and more in pure form. And so what we can do now is a really fun experiment where you take one of these and put it on an ant and throw it back in with his buddies. And does it get attacked or not? Take another one, put it on an ant, throw it in. Put a mixture of them on, throw it in. And you can manipulate this in all kinds of different ways to functionally test whether or not these are actually cues that cause ants to no longer recognize each other as being members of the same society. Um, here are some, uh, these are again uh, gas chromatographs, so on the x-axis we have time, on the y-axis we have concentration, and this just shows that by um, adding chemicals onto the exoskeleton, we're only changing one of these peaks. So there's the sort of natural hydrocarbon profile at the top with these two peaks that we're going to manipulate, shown by the arrows. If we um, treat an ant with one of these C35s, we only change the concentration of this peak. The rest of the profiles stay, stay the same. Same thing here. This is just a 37 carbon uh, hydrocarbon. So this just shows that we're only changing the particular chemical in the profile that we think we're changing. And so what happens when you do the experiment? Well, it works. So on the left-hand side of this, we have various different types of negative controls. You can take ants out of a colony. You can put a chemical on them that you don't think is involved in nestmate recognition. You can throw them back in with their nestmates, and they, they're not attacked. You can take them out, you can put a solvent on them, put them back with their nestmates, they're not attacked. 
you can fiddle with them in all the normal ways without changing their profile, and they're not attacked. So that's comforting to know, that the, that the handling of ants in this way doesn't trigger aggression. But then, as soon as you start adding these synthetic hydrocarbons to their exoskeleton, you start seeing them get attacked by nestmates. So here's a 15-methyl C35. This is a hydrocarbon that's 35 carbons long, has a methyl group on the 15 carbon. You put it on Argentine ants, they get attacked by their nestmates. If you use five times the concentration of that, you see a little bit of an increase. Here's a 17-methyl C35, you see the same thing. Here's a trimethyl, you see the same thing. Another trimethyl, you see the same thing. And if you mix all five of these together, you see very high levels of aggression. All right, so this is great. This tells us that this is sort of conclusive evidence that we've you know, been able to identify, synthesize, and behaviorally verify that these hydrocarbons are used as the labels for nestmate recognition. Right? So we're going to patent these and make a billion dollars and go retire on some Caribbean island. No, it's not that easy, unfortunately. Okay, and so, um, and so this is an active area of research in my lab. Um, we're not only looking at the hydrocarbons that are used for this nestmate recognition, it turns out that Argentine ants use chemicals for all kinds of different things. So we're exploring how they um, use chemicals to lay down and modify their foraging trail. They use chemicals to determine if they have enough queens in their colony and when they should produce more queens. And so um, we're following the same sort of procedure to try and identify these other elements of communication in, um, in Argentine ants as potential mechanisms for controlling them. I'm going to switch gears a little bit now and talk about sort of the other side of the nestmate recognition process. So we've been talking about labels a lot. I'm going to switch gears and talk about um, template formation. How do Argentine ants in their head know which um, ants to accept or reject? And I mentioned to you that templates are believed to fall, uh, form largely by imprinting early in the life of the ant, and that's true for Argentine ants. But it turns out we made this interesting observation in the field that suggests that Argentine ants can actually actively learn during their lifetime, too. And this affects their behavior, affects their template. And the first inklings of this came from a study performed by a postdoc, Melissa Thomas, in David Hallway's lab at UC San Diego, a collaborator of mine. And what she, what she found is sort of shown here in this cartoon version. Um, so we have, this is a sort of aerial view of a contact zone between two super colonies here in the introduced range, right? So we have this red super colony, the large super colony in California. And then here's one, one of these small secondary colonies that's probably a product of a secondary introduction from the native range. What she found, though, is when these two different super colonies meet, and there's a, sort of this um, boundary between them where they're fighting for territory, if you pair Argentine ants from immediately on either side of this colony boundary, uh, from one meter away on either side of the colony boundary, you see a very high level of aggression. Whereas if you pair ants from more distantly, more interior, sites away from this colony boundary, for example here versus there, you still see significant levels of aggression, but it's not nearly as high as the aggression shown by Argentine ants at the colony boundary. And this suggested to us, you know, there are lots of things that could potentially driving, be driving this, but one interesting possibility is that Argentine ants in this colony boundary are interacting with ants from different colonies very frequently, and they're learning that there are enemies around. And so they're becoming sensitized to the presence of these ants from a different colony, and they're sort of escalating their level of aggression towards ants from these other colonies. Whereas ants from the more interior sites are probably naive, right? They never encountered an ant from another colony, and so they think the world is, you know, happy and hunky-dory, and so they haven't, you know, they have just sort of, they're capable of recognizing when they encounter an ant from a different colony, but they don't have these elevated levels of aggression. And so we wanted to functionally test this in the lab, and so what we did is we brought in Argentine ants from these naive sites, these very interior sites in the, in the super colonies, and we paired them um, against a series of ants from a different colony. So we'd put these two ants together in a behavioral assay. They would recognize each other and fight. And then we'd try and separate them and you know, calm things down. And then we would take one of those ants and pair it again later against another ant from that same foreign colony, but a different ant, right? And ask, Did the, does the level of aggression change between the first time you encounter an ant from a different colony versus the second time versus the third time, right? Do individual ants with experience show escalating levels of aggression? And so here's, here are what the data look like for a first trial. If you take ants from two different super colonies and pair them together, you get about half of them attacked right off the bat, and about half of them are non-aggressive. Right? So you, you, we take two ants, we put them together, about half of them fight, and when we replicate this lots of times, about half of them fight and half of them don't fight. Right? And so what we're interested in, really, is this non-aggressive category. Right? So when we take these non-aggressive ants, and we pair them in a second behavioral assay, do they all stay non-aggressive like they were the first time around? Or do some of them switch over between becoming aggressive? Right? And this is what could account for this increase in aggression that you see, at or this higher level of aggression you see at colony boundaries. 
if these initially non-aggressive ants are learning that there's an enemy around and increasing their propensity to show aggression later, then that could lead to an overall increase in aggression. And sure enough, that's what we see. So if we take, so it divides up about 50-50 in the first trial. If we take these non-aggressive ants and pair them in a second behavioral assay against other um, ants from the same foreign colony, um, the majority of them stay non-aggressive that second time around, but about 30-35% of them switch over to becoming aggressive. Right? At the same time, if we take the aggressive, the ants that were initially aggressive the first time around and pair them in a second behavioral assay, we also have some of them that switch behavior too, but it's a much lower switching rate. We only have about 5-10% of them switch to becoming non-aggressive. And so the overall trend is for, after repeated trials, for RTC ants to become more and more aggressive with, with more and more exposures to ants from foreign colonies. And so in this case, this is an experiment where we did the first trial, we separated ants, let them calm down for 15 minutes, and we did the second trial 15 minutes later. But it turns out we see the same thing if we do the second trial an hour later. So uh, these are, so you know, the first time around we saw a 50-50 split between aggressive and non-aggressive, and then if we do the second trial an hour later, we see the same thing. There's a, a higher switching rate from non-aggressive to aggressive than there is back non-aggressive, leading to an overall increase in aggression. When we repeat the experiment again, doing it a day later, we see the same thing. And even a week later, we see the same thing. If anything, it's more extreme a week later. And this was amazing to us, because what this is telling us is that we're taking Argentine ants, we're pairing them to, in, together in a behavioral assay for just a few minutes. They're fighting it out or recognizing that there's an ant from a different colony. Then we separate them. They're marked with a little dot of paint. We throw them back in their colony in the lab. And then they go around and mill around for a week, doing all their ant things, hanging out with their buddies. And then a week later, we pair them in a behavioral assay, and they remember that single encounter from a week before with an ant from a different colony. And actually, I would expect that this goes on for a much longer time. A week is the maximum time we've done. But I wouldn't be surprised to see that these individual RGT ants remember the single encounter with an ant from a different colony and modify their behavior for the rest of their lives, become much more likely to show aggress aggression when encountering an ant from this different colony. Question? Yes. Why isn't it 100%? What makes an aggressive ant become uh, you know, more pacific? Why isn't it? Which 100%? Yeah, well, you've shown that there are some ants that were uh, initially aggressive, mm -hmm. and then suddenly they've gone little. Um, yeah, so like these here. That these, these that were initially aggressive and switched to becoming non-aggressive? Yeah. yeah, we don't know. I don't know. That's a great question. Or why is there this split initially anyway? What's different between these two ants? Why are some non-aggressive and some aggressive? Why is there this behavioral split? Which is what I'm going to show in the next slide, actually. Um, so. How long does they live? I'm an Argentine ant worker. I think the maximum we've seen them live in the lab is probably about eight months. In the field, it's probably a lot less, a lot shorter. Queens live about a year. OK, so how does this change if RGT ants encounter um, ants from a different colony more than just one, uh, more than just a second time? Um, these data are from uh, a, a follow-up experiment we did where we took individual ants and then paired them repeatedly against other ants from a different colony, right? And so um, on the x-axis here, we have the number of trials, the number of times an ant it was encountering an ant from a foreign supercolony. On the y-axis, we just have the percent of the trials that um, the ants displayed overall the replicates that we did. I forget how many replicates this. Oh, 500. So we did this 500 times, right? And so out of the 500 times, you know, it split. Um, th in this experiment, it wasn't exactly 50 50, it was about 55 45 the first trial. There's an overall increase in aggression with the second trial, right? And so the comparison between these two is what I was showing you on the previous slides. But then if we do a third trial, fourth trial, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, all the way to tenth trial, you see that the aggression displayed by ants steadily increases, but then it plateaus off at about four or five trials, right? And so this, is, this was actually also amazing to us because it revealed something that we had no idea existed within Argentine ant colonies. You know, there are other species of ants that have like soldiers and workers, or that have, um, you know, minims, tiny little ants, and media and major workers. Argentine ants all look the same. They're, um, they display no um, cast polymorphism, whatever. But when we start looking at behaviors like this, it reveals that there are hidden behavioral polymorphisms within Argentine ant colonies, right? Here we can see at least three sort of behavioral casts. We have a cast, a group of workers that are initially aggressive, right? About half of the workers are this aggressive cast. You know, maybe functionally similar to soldiers, you know, that, um, that you see in other ant colonies. And then about... Um, 15, 
20% of the colony are sort of pacifists, right? This plateaus off at about 80%. About 20% of the workers never show aggression. No matter how many times you pair them with another ant who's just hammering on them, they just don't attack, right? And then you have these switchers in the middle that switch from being non-aggressive initially to being aggressive, aggressive later. And so we're really interested in sort of figuring out what underlies these different, this behavioral polymorphism within colonies. Um, is it age? Is it something else? Is it genetic diversity? You know, what does this reflect? Um, clearly, you can imagine reasons why this might be adaptive, right? Because you have a colony that has a fixed number of, you know, workers that are sort of focused on being the colony defenders, the soldiers. And then you have this flexibility where you have individuals that are doing the foraging, doing the working, but if necessary, they can switch their behavior and become aggressive, right? These switchers between. And so this is something that we're actively pursuing um, in a series of studies not only looking at sort of the extent of this learning and memory, but also what specifically they're recognizing about these different colonies. Is this just an overall level of aggression that's changing, or is it specific towards the colony they've encountered? Sort of trying to figure out some of these details um, to explain this process. Okay, and now I'm gonna finish up with something that um, is a project that we've just recently finished up. Um, so, uh, we're, so, for a number of years, I've been doing population genetics, looking at how closely related individuals are, um, using these markers like microsatellites that aren't really sort of functional genes. They don't really do anything, but they're markers for how genetically similar individuals are. But what we're really interested in doing in many cases is getting into the actual genes, understanding what the genetic mechanisms are that are producing variation in hydrocarbons, producing variation in behavior, that are doing all kinds of different things. And so with the advent of next generation sequencing, it sort of puts the realm of doing a genome project within reach for non-model organisms. You know, this is something that has very few genomic resources developed for it, but with these new sequencing techniques that are available within just the past few years, you can take almost any organism and sequence the genome. And so on, as a first pass, um, we did a study where we looked at genome sizes of ants. Amazingly, people knew essentially nothing about the genome sizes of ants before we did this. And so we estimated the genome size of 40 species of ants from across the ant phylogeny. So these are just the different sub, subfamilies of ants. All ants fall within one family, and then there are these different subfamilies. And it turns out that ants overall have relatively small genomes between you know, 200 and 500 million bases, which is small for genomes. And Argentine ants have one of the smallest genomes of all the ants that we studied, about 250 million bases, about the size of the honeybee. And so, um, a few opportunities presented themselves to us. One was that we had a demo model of one of these next generation sequencers placed on campus um, for free use, essentially um, at the cost of reagents, but we didn't have to pay the service fees. And so um, in summer 2009, we embarked on um, the Argentine Ant Genome Sequencing Project like this. I got myself out of the office and out from behind my computer and back into the wet lab you know, trying to spend my summer cranking through as much free sequencing as I could on this demo model that was placed on campus. There are some specifics of the Jesus Genome Project that are here that um, are probably not of interest to you. We sequenced mainly a single queen pupa, but then we um, added sequencing from some workers later. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I do want to point out, though, is that unlike any other genome project that has come before, this is a totally community-funded genome. Right, this is like a super colony of researchers studying Argentine ants. We had no federal grant support for this. We had no grant support of any type for this project. It was, put, it was um, completed through you know, opportunities like this, taking advantage of a free sequencer, and um, a large group of people interested in Argentine ant research contributing small amounts of discretionary fund and lots of their time to developing this genome. Um, this genome sequence was just published a couple months ago in PNAS, and there are actually, I'm gonna end with just a few things that came out of this um, genome sequence that are relevant for what I've been talking to you about today. One of the first things is that it became immediately clear that Argentine ants are just bristling with chemical sensors, more than anything we've ever seen in the world before. So the, there are two ways, essentially, to detect chemicals in the world. You can taste them or you can smell them. These are the taste receptors in Argentine ants. They have 116 of these gustatory receptor genes, these taste receptor genes. And I've just, for reference, compared them to the other sequenced insect genomes. And um, the only one that exceeds that number is the flower beetle. Um, not Tetramorium, I'm coming up with the ant name. Tribolium. Um, and in many cases, you look at other things, like um, honeybees, which are fairly closely related to ants, right? They're in the same order, have only 10 of these gustatory receptor genes. And so Argentine ants have just gone crazy with the evolution of these receptors for God knows what, 
hopefully hydrocarbons. That's one of the things we want to piece together, is figuring out which of these receptors are the ones that are being used to detect the chemicals that we've studied so much. What if we look at their sense of smell? So this is their sense of taste. Argentinians are crazy. Same thing. 367 of these odorant receptor genes, right? There's nothing that even compares. Triolium, 341, but you know, there's nothing that exceeds what we found in the Argentine genome. All right. Oh, and let me go back to this gustatory receptor thing. So here's a phylogeny of the different gustatory receptors from honeybee, the jewel wasp, Argentinus, and um, Drosophila. And so you can see it's sort of scattered, it's color coded, the same as on the side there. It, you know, it's sort of scattered here. There are these different um, gustatory receptor families. You can see that Argentinus has some here, and some here, and some here. But then, bang, there's this major radiation of these taste receptors that are all closely related to each other. And then if you actually look in the genome, they're tandemly arrayed. That means they're right next to each other, all in a row. Bang, 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 bang. Probably from, you know, du duplications of parts of the genome that have been duplicated again and duplicated again and duplicated again, expanding out, you know, to about probably 70 of these receptors that are all in a row right there. Hmm? Do humans have gustatory receptors? Yeah, so we use gustatory receptors to taste and um, odor receptors to smell. And where do we, how many of our genes fall in that category? Uh, well, they're very, very different between us and insects. So mm -hmm. um, some, of the, some of the gustatory receptors have, and so the gustatory receptors are fairly closely related. Many of the um, olfactory receptors appear to have a different evolutionary origin. Um, I'm not sure how many humans have, but if you look at things like mice and rats, they have a lot more than this. And so these taste, and these gustatory receptors and um, odorant receptors are actually expressed largely on the antenna of ants. And so they're using these antenna as organs for both taste and smell, which is sort of interesting. You can think of them as like big sort of combinations of tongues and noses hanging off their head when <laughs> they're sampling the world. Okay, and then I'll just close with this one. So these are, this is a gene family known as cytochrome P450s. And we do have a lot of cytochrome P450s. These are something that is very conserved across uh, multicellular organisms, and they're typically used for detoxifying things, especially things in the diet. And it turns out that Argentinians have a huge number of these as well. They have 111 of these genes, compared to just 74 for the most closely related nymph genome, the red harvester nymph, which has come out recently. And so this suggests that uh, a couple of things. First, Argentinians are extreme generalists in terms of where they live and what they eat. You know, they eat, they can forage in a dumpster on Big Macs. They can go capture insects and kill them and eat them. They feed on honeydew from aphids and scale insects. So, so they eat lots of different things. That's one of the things that allows them to invade lots of different types of habitats, and that's probably controlled by this, or permitted by this. The fact that they have so many of these um, cytochrome P450s allows them to detoxify lots of different things from lots of different types of food and be dietary generalists. It's also important in terms of control, because these are the same genes that get um, acted on um, when um, insecticide resistance evolves. And so we've been hammering Argentine ants for probably 100 years with different types of um, insecticides, and nobody's taken a good close look at how sensitive Argentine ants actually are. Are they evolving resistance to some of these insecticides through time? And if they are, is it occurring in these genes, as we've seen for things like mosquitoes or flies? Um, and so I'm just going to close just to say that I've given you sort of a slice of, this is sort of the bread and butter of the research in my lab, but it's probably only about 40% of what we do in my lab. We do all kinds of other fun things. Um, people in my lab work on things from that vary as widely as orchid bees and the evolution of slave-making ants to pheromone communication in bud bugs. We do all kinds of fun stuff. I encourage you to go check out our webpage um, if you want to sort of get a taste of the different things that we do. Um, and I uh, especially would like to thank um, a couple generations of people who have worked in my lab as well as Ken Shea's lab at UC Irvine who synthesized the hydrocarbons for us. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have.